So things have happened recently that I think has made things really clear, no longer ambiguous, no longer contradictory, confusing, but really clear. I'm talking about what direction certain of uh, very prominent leaders in the church are trying to lead the church in. You know, when they talk about the upcoming World Synod of Bishops, they, they talk about it as a new way of being church. And it's been very unclear what this new way of church is supposed to be, but I think some recent events have really made it clear that you can fill in the dots and the picture is really now clear. So I'd like to tell you what I think the direction is and why it's no longer ambiguous and why there's an attempt being made to institute, institutionalize it and make it irreversible and how problematic that is and what a difficult situation we're going to be facing. But again, as I often say, it's happening under the hand of God. He's permitting it and he's got a plan to bring good out of it. But let's take a look about what's going on. Well, you know, every, you know, for the last number of years, there's been a number of uh, statements made, comments made, documents published, appointments made that have made people kind of uh, scratch their heads, saying, gee, how should we interpret that? That sounds a little bit like it's going off the track or maybe even over the cliff. And uh, But there's these other things that seem to be very clear, very good, and then these other things that seem to undermine it. And, you know, what's really going on? So let me kind of go through some of the dots that are on the, the canvas and how now we can kind of put those dots together and see what's emerging pretty clearly. Well, one of the first dots was uh, Pope Francis's answer to the question about somebody who had been in a homosexual relationship. And, uh, and Pope Francis said, who am I to judge? It, it made worldwide headlines, the... Uh, leading a uh, homosexual magazine in the United States named Pope Francis as the man of the year. And many in that, in that segment of things felt like uh, this was a harbinger of uh, church doctrine changing. And in various ways, it was made clear over the years, in different kinds of ways that no, the doctrine isn't changing, but our attitude is changing. And what exactly that meant was a little unclear. And certainly the Pope clarified that by that remark, he was uh, referring to if somebody who was in a homosexual relationship has repented and is trying to live a, a chaste life, uh, who, whom we to judge him? And that's that's a perfectly, you know, really good interpretation of that remark. But it, it kind of put a lot of uh, question marks into the minds of a lot of people. Another thing was... Um, the uh, question about truth and morality, uh, the, uh, the document, Amoris Laetitiae, from the Synod on the Family, it kind of, uh, it has some footnotes, it has some comments that really caused quite a bit of uh, controversy. A lot of, a lot of Catholic theologians uh, made an appeal to Pope Francis to please clarify it. Uh, there wasn't any response to that. And then uh, some cardinals asked the Pope to please clarify how, how, how this was being interpreted was really in harmony with what John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI had clearly ruled out as an acceptable approach to moral theology. Uh, the question was, the, the, the document seemed to say in, in a footnote that people who were divorced and remarried without having received an annulment, maybe would be able to receive communion in certain circumstances. And that maybe that could be extended to other people too, uh, in, in other irregular situations. And uh, different bishops published their opinions on what it meant. Different bishops' conferences published their opinions on what it meant. And the Argentinian Bishops' Conference published their opinion. And then the Maltese 
uh, Bishop's Conference published their interpretation, which then was immediately published in L'Osservatore Romano, the official uh, publication of the Vatican. And it basically said anybody who felt at peace about where they were with God, no matter what their objective living situation was or whatever sexual relationship they were involved in, should feel free to receive communion. Now, one of the very few bishops in Malta who signed on to that statement was then appointed Cardinal Grech as the uh, leader of uh, the, the synodal office that is in charge of future synods for the Catholic Church and now in charge of the synodal process that we're going through right now. And then, well, the Pope was very, very clear about uh, how terrible a clerical sexual abuse of minors was he seemed to do things that didn't seem like it was being taken so seriously when he invited to the Vatican Bishop Zanuck from Argentina who had been charged by the civil authorities with sexual abuse of a seminarian and uh, the Pope invited him to the Vatican and gave him a position uh, having to do with the Vatican finances which of course has seen many problems uh, eventually, he went back to Argentina and was convicted. And then, when various cardinals asked the Pope to please clarify that he wasn't contradicting the very important encyclical on moral theology written by John Paul II, very high authority, very taught to splendor, the splendor of the truth, he, he refused to do that. And maybe he didn't need to, you know, respond to such a direct request like that, but he could have made known in other ways that he was uh, not contradicting it, but he never has. In fact, it's pretty clear that those who are leading things right now in Rome don't like it, don't believe it, and are, want to leave it behind, which is very, very hard to do with such a high-level document. And then we have the Synod on the Amazon, and, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the wonderful things about Pope Francis is uh, in, in his early pontificate, he was so focused on evangelization. and He said, let's get out of the rectories, let's get out of the sacristies, let's get into the marketplace, let's really be uh, willing to share the goodness of, of the gospel with people in all different kinds of situations. Let's not be afraid of making a mess. And I just thought that was a really wonderful breath of fresh air. And uh, his first uh, apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, uh, was, a, was a breath of fresh air and has many, many positive things in it. And um, But then, as time went on, it seemed like there was less focus on evangelization in, in the sense of its core meaning of bringing people to Christ in the church and uh, calling people to repent from their sins and believe in the Savior and be, become joined to the church, uh, and more and more warnings against proselytizing. Now, proselytizing is undue pressure on people, forcing them to believe or inducing them to believe by giving them financial incentives or stuff like that. But it seems like the focus switched from evangelization to whatever you do, don't proselytize. And, and that left people a lot of confused, like, with because there's no definition of proselytism and how it's distinguished from evangelization. So that's just another thing that threw a little murkiness into the, into the atmosphere. And then in the Synod of the Amazon, one of the very main leaders of the Synod was a missionary priest who boasted that in his over 30 years of missionary work in the Amazon, he had never baptized somebody, and he was proud of that. And what that was an indication of is that there's been a, a growing focus on the horizontal dimension of the church's mission, helping people improve their life in this world, and a less and less emphasis on the need to bring people to faith and repentance and conversion. And, and quite honestly, uh, the, the, the document that came out of the Amazon Synod, the other documents that come out in the environment and, and other things, uh, well, while they contain many really good and wonderful things, they're giving the impression that the primary focus of the church should be on the horizontal and helping the world be a better place for people to live in it, which is certainly an essential part of Catholic social teaching and, and a demand of charity and justice. But 
quite honestly, the, the primary mission of the church is not improving the environment uh, and, and saving the ecosystem of the environment. Oh, that's something we should do. But the primary mission of the church is calling the people living in the Amazon and all over the world, whether they're Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist or Hindu, to recognize Jesus Christ as the only provision that God has given by which sins can be forgiven and people can be saved. That's the mission, and it's really been de-emphasized in many different ways. You know, some other confusing things were the, the Vatican kind of signed on as a signatory to uh, various global sustainable goals of the uh, United Nations and experts being invited to talk many times in the Vatican. Uh, and, and some of these sustainable goals are really contrary to the faith, and they're promoting abortion and various other kinds of things. Very, very puzzling. Now, there's a saying that personnel is policy, that it's the, appointing, it's the appointments you make that really establish your policy. And here's where there's a, a number of things that are less and less ambiguous, more and more clear, and this is where the dots are really kind of being filled in. One of the remarkable appointments was appointing Archbishop Paglia, an Italian archbishop, coming from a bankrupt Italian diocese, coming from a place that was controversial because he commissioned a, a mural to be painted on the wall of his cathedral uh, by a homosexual artist. And there's a self-portrait of him there in the, in the uh, mural. Uh, in an ambiguous situation. And uh, anyway, he got appointed to be head of the John Paul II Institute for Marriage and the Family, which was established by John Paul II to strengthen the traditional teaching about marriage and family in the Catholic Church. And students from all over the world came there, and branches were established in Australia and the United States and other country. And then Archbishop Paglia uh, decided to uh, cancel the courses of two of the moral theologians who were like the very foundation of teaching in this institute and replace them with uh, Italian theologians from Northern Italy who had published documents, published articles, sort of raising questions about Catholic teaching about the area of sexuality and marriage and family life. Now, there wasn't any ambiguity in this. This was objectively an action that totally changed the direction of the Institute of John Paul II for Marriage and the Family and installed dissenting theologians. And then other appointments. Cardinal Supich was appointed uh, the Cardinal for Chicago, and he's been an outspoken advocate of a very a liberal interpretation of Amoris Laetitiae. He says we can't restrict it just to divorced and remarried people who don't have annulments, but it should be extended to everybody, including gay couples. And, uh, and that really seems to be the direction. That really seems to be the way the wind is flowing. And he's been very favored in Rome. He's been appointed to the Congregation for Bishops. Now we call it the Dicastery for Bishops. That's in charge of vetting and the nomination of bishops throughout the world. Cardinal Tobin, who's also very sympathetic to this agenda, has also been assigned to the Dicastery for Bishops. And so the two main Americans on that very important Vatican office that chooses bishops for the whole world are very much in the direction of a very liberal interpretation of Amoris Laetitiae, which is very much in a different direction than the traditional teaching of the church and very high level magisterial uh, descriptions of it, including the catechism of the Catholic Church. And then a very amazing appointment. Uh, I've spoken about this in another video, but Bishop McElroy of San Diego was appointed a, a, a cardinal. And, uh, and and after he was named the cardinal, he, he published this most radical article in the Jesuit magazine America, where he talked about we need to demolish ex structures of exclusion in the church and open up the Eucharist to everybody. Uh, 
And uh, he particularly mentioned how we shouldn't discriminate anymore between people living a chaste life and those not living a chaste life. And he particularly made reference to uh, the gay community. And uh, this, of course, is really a departure from the faith. And Bishop Popraki, who's in charge of the canonical affairs and government uh, committee of the American bishops, wrote an article saying, you know, in, unless he and Bishop uh, Cardinal Hallerick, another appointment of the Pope, who was appointed to be the leader of the upcoming Synod in October, uh, and unless these people kind of explain what they're saying in a way that's in harmony with the faith, they're, they're really de facto in heresy. Cardinal Hallerick, by the way, the Archbishop of Luxembourg, was appointed by the Pope to lead the synodal process that's coming under Cardinal Grech, who's over the whole office. And he very publicly has said, we need to change our teaching on homosexuality. And uh, it's an open question now. And even though the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith just a couple of years ago said we can't bless same-sex unions because we can't bless sin, uh, Cardinal Hallerick said, well, that's an open question. And for all these people now that are being appointed to these key positions, that's more than an open question. It's a direction that pretty clearly they want to go in. German bishops, of course, everybody knows they're heading in this direction, you know, full steam ahead. They're ignoring various warnings that even the Vatican has given to them. Cardinal Marx has been one of the longest standing advisors to Pope Francis. He was president of the German Bishops Conference. He openly has said that we need to change our teaching on homosexuality and we need to change the catechism of the Catholic Church. So I don't think we can say that the direction is ambiguous anymore, particularly now that the Pope has appointed the new head of what we used to call the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Now it's called the Dicastery or Office of the Doctrine of the Faith. And this just happened recently, and now I think the picture is pretty clear. The dots, the last dot is there, and it's not ambiguous anymore. It's not puzzling anymore. Well, it's not contradictory anymore. It's sort of like it's all lined up moving in this direction. So the Pope appointed Archbishop Fernandez from uh, his own native Argentina, who's been a longtime Episcopal theological advisor to Pope Francis. Pope Francis actually appointed him uh, an archbishop. He's also named him as the head of the Pontifical Catholic University in Argentina. But when he was back in Argentina, when he was just Cardinal Broglio, Bergoglio, and he appointed Bishop Fernandez as the head of uh, the Catholic University of, of Argentina, uh, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith didn't approve his appointment and investigated his writings for about a year and a half and had some serious questions about his orthodoxy. And eventually he was uh, allowed to take his role as rector uh, of the Pontifical University in Argentina. But as soon as Pope Francis became Pope. He made him the Archbishop of La Plata, Argentina. And uh, many people have said, including people very close to the situation, that he's the primary theologian that advises the Pope, and he's the Pope's primary ghost writer. And he was on the writing committee for Morris Laetitia uh, and you know other other important documents. So one of the things that, one of the controversies that's erupted after this appointment became known is that people looked at his writings and they found a book called Healing With Your Mouth, The Art of the Kiss. Now, when this first got known, people all people had to go by was the title, uh, but the book is out in Spanish. There's an English translation online. There's some errors in the translation. One of the errors is that the translator has changed uh, the male sex that sometimes the kiss is directed to, to all female, uh, and you know other things like that. So uh, the book is pretty shocking. Uh, I've read large parts of it, and uh, it's gross, it's erotic, I'd say it's pornographic. Archbishop Fernandez has defended it since he's been appointed, saying, well, he just wrote that as a catechesis for teenagers. 
that makes me even more concerned is not something that would do anything but encourage teenagers to engage in sexual relationships, really. But I'm not concerned mainly about that book. I'm concerned about his views on morality, his views on salvation. In 1995, he was reported to have, have written in an article that he's totally, fully convinced that everybody's saved. There is a line in uh, Evangelii Gaudium that he was purported to be the ghostwriter for that says that uh, it's against the logic of the gospel that anybody would be lost forever. Of course, that's not true. That's the heresy of universalism. You can't judge something, somebody by just one statement, but when they start to appear here and there and everywhere, and when it probably is underlying the reason why there's less concern about the seriousness of sexual immorality than the church is actually really concerned about. Uh, it kind of all goes together in a certain way. When he accepted the appointment, uh, he did a Facebook post and uh, Pope Francis wrote him a personal letter saying, I don't want you to be correcting heresy I want you to be exploring dialogue with culture and science and creating, uh, encouraging theologians, particularly theologians that don't stay at their desk, but uh, get out there. And, and that, that's, that's good. You know, theologians should be in touch with life and everything like that. And, but the Pope then made statements like reality is more important than ideas. Well, it's not either or. Us Catholics value real life experience, but we know that real life experience in order to be correctly understood has to be understood in light of the revealed word of God. That uh, it isn't just here we have the revealed word of God, here we have experience, here we have opinion, here we have theological speculation and put it together and take your mix. The controlling optic by which we need to look at the world and judge everything is through the optic of God's revelation to us of what is revealed. And that's just really, really important. And so I'm concerned about uh, the direction of things. One of the things the Pope told Archbishop Fernandez that he wants to make sure that all that documents coming out from the Vatican now, uh, except the recent magisterium. Well, we've got a big glaring problem right now. You know, when Pope Benedict XVI said, how do we interpret correctly Vatican II? We interpret it correctly when we interpret it in harmony with the tradition of the church. But what we have in a Morris Lake Tizia, and more particularly about the direction that things are moving in, is actually a contradiction of a very high level magisterial document, very taught to splendor, that was written uh, to clear up exactly the kind of moral confusion that we're seeing here. So we've got a problem of conflicting high-level magisterial documents. And I don't know how it's going to get sorted out. Uh, it's very serious. It's going to impact people on every level of the church. There's going to be bishops and priests in some places that go full steam ahead into saying, oh yeah, it's okay for people to receive communion even if they're in irregular situations because maybe it's the best they can do at the time or uh, it's one of the lines in Amoris Letizia, maybe people are doing the best they can do at the time and it's God's will that they do that. So they, it may be God's will for them to continue to live in uh, fornication, adultery, homosexual relationships because that's the best they can do. But that's not the approach of the church. The approach of the church is you need to turn away from your sin. You need to admit that this is sinful. You need to ask God for mercy and forgiveness. And you need to ask God for the, the grace to be delivered from the bondage you're in, from the deception you're in. 
And priests and bishops need not to confirm people in their sin, in their ignorance, in their deception, in their self-deception, in their influence that the cultures had on them, but call them to the beautiful truth of Jesus Christ and, and the death he died for our forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, you know, when Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, cut it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your right foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. He's, he's not literally saying, pluck out those things in your body or cut off your wrist or cut off your foot. But he's saying, do whatever it takes to get free of serious sin because serious sin will kill you. It's not true that the logic of the gospel is that nobody's ever condemned forever. It's not true at all. The Lord respects our freedom. And there can't be true love or true friendship unless there's the possibility of saying no to mercy and no to love. And many people do. Many people do. There's a great rebellion against God going right now in our culture, and it's also going on in our church. So what do we do? Well, I really want to recommend this book. It's called The Church in Crisis Pathways Forward. I wrote the book because of what I'm talking about today. All these things were very, very clear, and they're now even clearer. But the first six chapters go into depth about the, the nature of the deception. The final seven chapters talk about pathways forward. And I want to particularly refer you to chapter six, where it says, is anyone responsible? This directly deals with the barn door that's been opened up that people are flooding through to affirm people that it's okay to live in sexual sin and other kinds of sin as well. No, the whole thrust of the gospel, the whole thrust of the Bible, the whole thrust of the truth in the church is not to try to figure out whether people are culpable or not or to what degree they're culpable, but to call them out of what's objectively wrong because what's objectively wrong is not just an offense to God, but it's harming the people who are doing these things. The word of God is not arbitrary. The moral law is not arbitrary. The moral law is the path to happiness. The moral law is the path to God. And yes, we can't live this by ourselves in our own strength. And yes, sometimes we become slaves to sin. But Jesus came to deliver us from slavery to sin. So uh, chapter 6, I'd, I'd really recommend it uh, You know, for anybody who has any, any concern about these issues. Church in Crisis Pathways Forward. You can get it at renewalmercies.net or amazon.com. It's also available in an audible book. Audible book. And um, I just think it's pretty clear right now. This big last dot that just fell into place with who was appointed to guard the faith in the church really is confirming the direction that our leaders right now want to move the church in. And it's moving in a direction that's departing from scripture and tradition. It's departing from the clear truth about moral theology spoken in very tight to splendor by John Paul II based on scripture and tradition. What do we do? We put our trust in the Lord. We intercede for our leaders. We intercede for our church. We intercede for our world. We need to ask God to rescue us from the confusion, rescue us from the division. It's going to be painful in the days going forward. It's going to be confusing. It's going to be, it's going to be difficult. But the Lord is with us. There's nothing happening that he's not permitting, and he's with us. And he wants us to keep our eyes on him and get up every day and ask the Lord, how can I please you today in my life with my responsibilities? We can't solve these problems ourselves, but we can pray for them to be solved and we can be faithful witnesses ourselves to the revealed word of God, the revealed truth of God that can set people free from any kind of bondage or addiction and deliver us into the glorious kingdom of his son, Jesus.